So this is actually the first guitar I ever played in my life. It used to sit in my grandparents' attic. It belonged to my Uncle Danny. It used to be in much nicer condition. He used to play it all the time, so it was set up nice, but it, it's the first guitar I ever played. WMC, which I don't know what that means at all. It's from Japan. I mean, it kind of still plays awesome. The frets are really low and the neck is thin. Kind of feels like a Fender, but it's a cool guitar. Every one of these is going to sound like total sh Should I introduce myself? Yeah. I'm Jamie Stillman. <laughs> From Earthquaker Devices, uh, we're in what we call the third room of our old shop. We used to store parts in here, and now it's filled up with multiple employees of Earthquaker Devices. Garbage. I actually have no idea how I ended up collecting junk, but I've been hoarding mediocre gear, I think, since I was like 14 or 15. Half working PV215 cabinets, old pedals, broken cables, shitty guitars that look like nice guitars. I think mostly collected all that stuff because my parents' basement is where all my bands practice and people would just bring stuff over and leave it, like John Finley, with this polytone bass, I think might be the first like junk collection that I had, like the first piece in the pile that sat in my uh, closet in the basement on its headstock body in the air, I think for like a year. And then we just started piling things in there, roto toms, mm -hmm. cowbells, you know, no one wants. <laughs> We didn't know what we had. Like there could be vintage stuff in there. We didn't know. Like I know I had old boss pedals and old electro harmonic stuff and you know, cool, weird guitars and old silver tone and stuff like that. But probably when I was like 16 or 17, we found this place called Empire Guitars in Streetsboro, amazing guitar store. And we would start bringing this stuff to them. And then you'd leave with like, like, you know, a 70s music master or I got a uh, 74, I think, Ludwig, butcher block, like total Hesher drum set with like three or four rack toms and a 24 inch kick drum and two floor toms. And it was like two broken SM57s, a pile of cables that could have been for like, you know, an antenna on a house and 200 bucks. It was like, I had that drum set for like 10 years. It sounded great. And I wish I still had half of that stuff, like sold it like at the dawn of eBay for next to nothing. I didn't understand that it was worth anything. I just thought it looked cool because the bands that I was getting into at the time had stuff like that, like Sonic Youth and Fugazi and stuff. Like that was when I feel like I really first started to notice gear. My main guitar for a long time, I, was, I played guitar in a band called The Party of Helicopters for like 10 years and I had one nice guitar, the Epiphone Scroll 550. And I think in researching that guitar is like when I, like the first time I can really remember being like, oh, there's different models of this guitar and this one is the nicest one and here's why. You know, set neck with binding and block inlays and it had these special pickups and stuff. I think that's really like the first piece of gear where I was like, okay, this is what makes this one nicer than the other one and that I was actually actively hunting for. And it just kind of snowballed, I think, from there. I had an old Fairmount cabinet, which I think might have been a Ford logo, put on a cabinet. Somebody, it looks like somebody made a Marshall cabinet from their memory of a Marshall cabinet. It was like big, but in all the wrong ways. Like, it looks like they were like, this is what a slant cabinet looks like. And it was like this tall, but like that wide. And when I bought it, it was empty and I used my first credit card, Discover, <laughs> to 
to buy four uh, Celestian speakers at Lentium's Music for probably like a thousand dollars or something like that. And those, you know, start of credit card debt for me. I think I paid those off 15 years later in a settlement. Uh, <laughs> you know, whatever, collecting gear, it's cool. So this is old Earthquaker. It used to be lined with desks around the side. Screen printing area over there. I sat here for a while. Now it's filled with junk and it's a practice space. All these amps. It's a Jaguar bass amp. I think it's a close, I think it's a 200 watt version of an Ampeg SVT with maybe a little less features. Whatever it is, it sounds awesome. Supro. With super awesome satellite CUDA. These amps are all what I thought would be a good idea at one point. Ames Personalized Producer, an amazing name for an amp. And this is such a weird setup for an amplifier with these knobs like this. And uh, when I got it, for some reason they built it with the circuit board outside of the chassis and it just sat on the top and then the tubes were sitting inside of it. So the second you would hit a note, if it was sitting on a cabinet, it would just rattle and the tubes would shake out. So I had uh, Joe Golden rebuild the amp entirely. So the circuit boards inside and the tubes are actually mounted on the chassis and now it works great. But in the time that it took to do that, I had purchased a super lead and used it and then gone through it and then got a Model T. So now it sits on the shelf. Tysco Checkmate 25 Guitar Center used for $40. I bought it mostly because it has that little meter in it that lights up, but it has really awesome tremolo. Impact amp. Kind of just sounds like a really nice bassman. Joe Golden modded trainer. Sounds super awesome. It was very dirty, like a very fuzz style, like breakup to it. Really bass heavy. PB musician. I saw Queens of the Stone Age and Troy was using one of them and his guitar sounded awesome. So I went and looked for one and it sounds pretty cool. I don't know. It looks, it looks like that. So now it sits here on the floor and holds a pedal board. It's a pedal board I used the last time Party of Helicopters played and it has that. Oh, cool. I should take that. With KMD analog delay, my first pedal. This one was broken. I bought another one and I took the pieces from that one and fixed this one. And then I think this actually broke in the last song of the last show that we played. <laughs> Caused some problems. <laughs> stuff an amp has, the less likely I am to be interested in it. Like I would never look at an amp that had 48 knobs on the front and be like, think of all the shit I could do with this. I'd look at it and be like, God, that would be a nightmare to fuck with in a live situation. I think that like my number one criteria for an amp to use in a band is that it can get really, really loud and stay clean. And you can run sub octaves through it and it won't, you know, cave in on itself. Probably the one that I used for the longest amount of time would be the Music Man HD 130, solid state, front end, tube, power amp. Um, I, I love solid state amps. There's something about them. They, they're flat. I know a lot of guitar players don't really like them because of that, but I think that that's a big benefit if you use pedals. I ended up buying the Model T when I started working on the pedal for Sun, just so I could kind of have some idea of how the stuff that they used and the stuff that I was working on would interact with that amp. And rather than borrowing one, I just figured I should probably own one of these. And I bought one and ended up right away, like kind of falling in love with it. 
Uh, this is the Model T and the A10. This is, I think, an earlier one where they're narrower. And they're made for like the GTM 45. I took the baffle out and replaced the uh, grill cloth. And I think I put it on the wrong way. It's facing the wrong way. It's supposed to be vertical. It's horizontal. And then replace the speakers with one side are Celestian Gold and one side is vintage 30s, I want to say. I like the way that 10 sound better with guitar. It's still like, you know, you get enough of them in a cabinet, there's enough low end that gets pushed, but it's still really focused. And I've tried to use a bunch of different cabinets, but I keep coming back to this thing. I think it's perfect sound. And then the Model T, which is just... You know, I feel like a, a really good mix of like a Fender and Marshall type sound. Nice breakup, very loud. That's how I set it. It's my amp. Yeah, I mean, there's things that I've gotten rid of that I wish I still had. Uh, the first Marshall 810 cabinet I got, which is the wider bodied one, I wish I still had that. Uh, before I sold that cabinet, I had a local guy, Michael Perkheiser trace it and make blueprints and then I had him make me a clone of that cabinet but as a 412 in red Tolex and then I sold that and I wish I had that too <laughs> and a really nice 60s like green basket weave 412 cabinet that weighed a billion pounds that was in mint condition green Tolex Perfect amp. I think I bought that cabinet for like 200 bucks. Sold it for like 250. So stupid. That sounded really good. This Space Echo and this rack and this ridiculous board are all part of some dude's fantasy. Uh, it was like some crazy DIY project. I remember seeing this stuff like on forums where people would make jokes like, hey, this is my pedal board or whatever. And like, you know, when I first started getting interested in forums like 2003 or four, the stuff was kind of making the rounds. And then one day I walked into Ben Vihorn's studio and it was sitting there just out on the floor. I'd known him for a while at that point. We practiced in that studio, recorded a bunch of stuff in there, never knew he had it. And then just he had pulled it out and was sitting there and my head almost exploded. He was like, I'm gonna sell that. I didn't even care how much it was. I needed to have it. So that's a perfect example of impulse hoarding. Starting with this, this is a like brand new Space Echo. I don't think it was ever used. It's like perfect, but dude modded it. I have no idea how. I think there's an output for every head. I have no clue what's going on in there because none of this stuff works as far as I know. I think it's, it's just an unfinished project. This is the controller, the flight deck for this uh, ridiculous system. It's got a who knows button. Got a Frank Zappa button. There's normal and there's Frank Zappa. Master oscillator, which is why the data corruptors master oscillator is called master oscillator. So there would be something that screws in here and this like sit on there this little like robot head and this has like all the circuitry for everything that's in here and then i believe and this like i don't know how many pins that is but there's a lot of pins this thing over here came with the shirt but yeah this screws in Sounds cool. So this is the arm for the Space Echo. It would connect in there. And this claw, which front. Like you went through all of this trouble to make this thing and then like couldn't come up with a good way to like get this to stick in place. So stuck that shirt in there. And that is how you would set the height of this thing. Space Echo would sit in there. And then all of this runs back 
to an amp and the amp actually powers it all. I don't think it ever worked. And I can't help but feel like if it did work, it'd be so unreliable and probably very, very noisy. But it's like, uh, as far as I can tell, the only like piece of like gear, like legitimate gear folk art that I feel like I've ever seen. I wish I had more information about this thing. I think in like three or four years ago, somebody posted a link to what looked like an Angel Fire website. And it actually had a picture of it all set up in front of his garage. It looked like it was from like the early 80s. And had a little bit of information, but not much more than what I knew. I wish that I could find the person who made this. I mean, I've had people tell me that they had it as their screensaver and stuff. And like, I used to see it on like the Harmony Central forum all the time. Like it would get posted every once in a while. Like this is my pedal board. Now it is my pedal board. What could this possibly have been for? This <laughs> KML. <laughs> Like, what is this? It says 1987. It really just does not feel like 80s to me. Okay, Canadian patent, or patent. Then it says made in the USA, right above Canadian patent. Then right next to it, Canadian patent again. You can plug a microphone into it. I don't know. I wonder how far he got into this before, like, he was like, you know what? Like, this is his train, like, you know, those basements that are like, end up like, uh, like a full grown adult has like a whole tiny town with like a train going through it. I guess it leans more on the hoarder side than on the collector side. It's sort of, I saw it, had to have it, and I've never really looked at it. It's just the thing that I know I have and then I show people. <laughs> and then this stuff is our studio where we record, you know, all our demo videos and Earthquaker sessions and stuff. But this is a good example of a horde for me, I guess. Uh, when I was younger, I was a dude who had the A track and I would record all the bands in the neighborhood. And then one day we could all afford to record in studios and I stopped doing that. And, you know, that was the extent of my recording knowledge. I knew how to work a Tascam A track and then decided to just try to get into recording again like after the digital age came in and i was like totally lost by it so i was just collecting recording gear little by little with no place to put it and eventually it's like one day like we have enough stuff to turn you know make a little studio and then we did this it's uh like you know nobody wants that board at all ever, but it is actually perfect. It does all the things you need it to do, and it's quiet, and it works, both analog and digital. Kind of cool, little old eight-track mixing board that I got when I bought a uh, Tascam 238, I think is the model number. Either way, it's the rack, like the most pro version of a cassette eight-track that Tascam made. Goes in a rack. I knew of its existence like when I was like a teenager, but it was like then that was like, you'd spend a fortune if you wanted one of those. So I just had the eight, the gray eight track. You could only use four channels at once, but I always wanted that one. And then seven or eight years ago, I remembered that I always wanted it. <laughs> Put a safe search in eBay and found one, mint condition, like new in a box. No one had ever opened it. I was the first person to open the thing. And then I bought this board to go with it. And it turned out that a new old stock cassette eight track player really needed to be used. It was a piece of shit straight out of the box. There were so many problems with it that it wasn't even worth fixing. And I sold it for 200 bucks, but I kept this and it's actually wired into all this in the event that we would ever need any mediocre, slightly noisy mic prees. Sounds really great with a snare drum though. But I also just like mixing it from the computer, just two track into the tape machine. I think perfect example of how the internet is totally wrong. If you look up that tape machine, like anybody on those gear forums will be like, that's a garbage consumer tape machine. That tape machine is great. One inch 24 track. I know that's 
pretty stupid, but sounds good. It's noise, like perfect tape sound, very, very minimal noise. If you mix anything from the computer onto that and even just put it back into the computer, it sounds great. Mellotron purchased from the basement of a functioning doctor's office in Green, Ohio, suburb of Akron, where he also had the board that Van Halen 1 was recorded on. He just had his hoard in the basement of his medical practice, just in a plaza by a grocery store. And it was just full of stuff like this down there. But I had it rebuilt by Custom Vintage Keys in LA, and now it's super reliable. Probably as nice as an old Mellotron could get. And then right next to it is this super heavy, terrible sounding, annoying organ that we got from Matt Horak, who does all of our illustrations on the pedals. It was in his aunt's house. You know, in the case of show us your junk, actual junk, total garbage. But we keep it around. It looks cool. Grandma's parlor organ. I think with having a big collection of gear, like it's partly cool because, you know, I have some old stuff like tape echoes and the Mellotron and, you know, Univibe, Ludwig Phase 2, like some weird old guitar effects and like cool old guitars, microphones, studio gear. That stuff is useful. Like it gets used. Like it's nice to have that on hand for like recording and things like that and then like you know the work side of me I guess it's nice to know like what's out in the market today alongside the things that I make it's nice to have a reference for that stuff but a lot of the like old guitars and things like that old amps that I have that I collect because like you know I thought they would be useful or like they played nice but they needed work and then I never got to it that stuff piles up and I think the overwhelming feeling that I have from having such a big collection of that stuff is anxiety. It's just, I have all these things and I'm never going to get to them. Uh, every time I pick them up, I'm like, oh, that's why I bought it. Cause it does this thing. And then I put it back down. I never use it again. And like, if you don't use old stuff, it falls apart. So I'm sort of like responsible for killing all of the stuff that just sits in my basement. And that gives me <laughs> a lot of anxiety. My problem. Uh, my basement where I put all the stuff that I collect. <laughs> this thing, this electroharmonics guitar synthesizer. Uh, super rare, if I read correctly, they there's like 10 of them in existence and they never really worked. They never won out. But when they do work, they're awesome. Juan already found this for me. I think at a music store in Washington is either him or Nick bought it and had it sent to me. I was assured that it worked and it actually doesn't. So now it's just a somewhat expensive decoration, but I'm hoping that I can get that working someday, <laughs> which is kind of the case with a lot of this stuff here, like these, this organ tone and the Ad Neko oil can delays. I got the pair of those at the Van Nuys amp show they're in like great condition. The only problem with them is the, the oil dried up, which I have right here and I've had it right here forever and I just haven't put them in. Ace Tone is basically an analog delay pedal built into this little box like a tape echo. I bought it in Japan at uh, Akiba Ishibashi a couple of years ago. Sounds great. It's like a super clean analog delay. That's actually functioning. This works. I feel like uh, it might be like the in-between between like a tape echo and a pedal, but I don't really know the history of it. Again, kind of a sucker for anything with a little meter on it. Yeah, that's like half of the thing, but it sounds great. It's cool. This on the other hand, the Quadrasound Blender. Garbage. Terrible all around. The worst reverb ever. I don't even remember where I got it from. But I know that I've tried to sell this like a million times and no one wants it. Q 
can't remember what model this is, but I can tell you that it has a button that says Room Rocker on it. And that's pretty cool. This one, this one I don't think works. This one does work and it sounds pretty cool. I bought this like literally one minute into New Year's at a New Year's party. One minute into the new year already buying useless gear that just collected dust. But it sounds cool. It sounds fine. Look at the way that lights up. It's cool. So yeah, I have an, an enormous pedal collection. It's not actually as big as it used to be because I've sold hundreds of them over the years. I mean, I have a big pedal collection partly because I'm interested in pedals, but I do think the fact that I make pedals for a living definitely fuels the collection. There are things that I have just because I want personally, and then there are things I have because there are similar products and categories that we make pedals in. So. It's nice to know what else is out there. Pen fuzz bomb, definitely somebody's DIY project. It was sold to me as super rare vintage fuzz pedal, even though I knew full well this was garbage, but, and the guy was like trying to pull one over. I think it was like 20 bucks and it's ridiculous. Although I could be wrong. Like I might find out that it like, this might be the rarest fuzz pedal ever made, but I doubt it. Pile of shit. Uh, the Miku Stomp. Well, there's a cat setting that I really liked. I don't know which one it is, but yeah. <laughs> I feel like that gets called out all the time whenever we do videos down here. People are always like, Miku Stomp. But they have nothing really to say about it. It's like a joke that the only funny part is that it exists. Like you can't really talk about it beyond that because everyone gets it. One of these is the first, this one, the first pedal I ever modded. It was when I still believed everything on the internet and it was sold to me as this like amazing tone changing kit where it was like, you know, these special yellow metal film caps were gonna blow my mind with their great clear tone. I was like, that's what happens when you mod a pedal, like the same thing, but it's just slightly louder. I wasn't really <laughs> too into it, I guess. But, you know, I modded a Maxon pedal, it sounds great. <laughs> that really will change your life. And this is the rat pedal that I used all the time in Party of Helicopters. I hated it, but it was the only real distortion pedal that I had. So I would use it with like very little distortion, but a lot of volume. Now I actually really love this pedal. I feel like I understood, got to understand the rat from making the life pedal. But I do have a bunch of other rats that I bought. All the other ones I have, I bought for research for the sun pedal. Any Earthquaker pedals that are like modified versions of old fuzz pedals, usually I'm just going off of, you know, one part schematic, one part what I've heard. If I've ever played through the pedal, like my memory of that, like I don't own a single vintage fuzz face, but we've had a number of pedals based on fuzz faces, but I've played through a billion of them and they all sound different. So that's enough to show me like, I can't spend two to $3,000 blindly on like reverb or eBay to buy an old fuzz face and have it show up and it's one of the ones that sucks. And then, you know, I could fix it, but what is the fun in that? You just don't come across them in stores, so I don't own one. But then there are certain situations like when we got asked to do the Park Fuzz Sound by Mitch Colby, even though I know that pedal is a Tone Bender 3 because it's just what it is, I just sort of felt like I should have that pedal because it's such a specific pedal. There weren't very many of them made. I miraculously found one the first day I looked and ended up buying it. And that's like one rare situation where I have bought the old pedal before I made a clone of it. And then, you know, a lot of the other old fuzz pedals that I have, I just bought because I wanted personally. Sighting fuzz, 
bought it in Japan. The Murano Exciting Fuzz sounds great. It's like, I think based on a big muff, this pedal. It sounds awesome. The Old Foxy Lady, bought by Patrick Carney of the Black Keys for $10 at Ales of Ohio. Is that what that pawn shop was called? Uh, didn't work. Batteries just disconnected inside. I fixed it and then he let me keep it. So $10, Akron, Ohio. Rosak New Fuzz, at one point my favorite fuzz pedal ever made. One side of the spires based on this. Although the circuit board for this is like completely encapsulated in uh, like some kind of ceramic, it looks like a big ceramic cap. And there are people who claim they have hacked it open and traced the schematic and put it up on the internet. I built that schematic. It doesn't sound anything like it. I bought an old wah, fuzz wah, that was supposed to have that little thing in it. And I thought that I was super careful and could totally chip away at all the ceramic shit to figure out what was really happening inside of that and on my very first chip i shattered the whole thing into a million pieces and then just decided to make a sound alike for that side of the uh spires a marlboro whaler marlboro cigarettes I got this, this whole set of Electrolabs pedals with Mother. Mother is the power supply and they all, they are all powered through this little, these connection points. And I mostly got this cause the concept is cool and I had never heard of them and somebody was selling the whole set. So I was like, I should probably I should probably get that. And then that's the follow up. I should probably get that and then put it in my basement and never think about it again. So actually, it's the first thing I think I bought on Reverb when Reverb came out. All this Death by Audio stuff, I love Death by Audio. It just makes you want to play with it. I feel like the knob selection, graphic choices. Really like all their stuff. These damn pedals. I mean, inside they're like works of art. They look real nice, but they sound great. Like just really good versions of vintage circuits. Like this is a Dallas Rangemaster and this is a tone bender. This one's Sola sound really, but it's built by David Main, who owns Dam. He builds all these vintage pedals for them. And yeah, that's where the tone bender came from, Sola sound. So they're just reissuing them. But they're like, they're built really well. They sound like classic fuzz pedals without like any modern improvements other than they're quiet. There's not a lot of noise to them. I can't say it across the board, like I've never bought something when I've thought about an idea. Like when I made the depths, I certainly bought a bunch of Univive like products beforehand. Cause it's like, I get the concept of that effect, but it's such a specific sound that I just sort of felt like I need more examples of what this sound is, because I like it, but I want to try to do something different. That would be a perfect example of how things escalate. Like, I start with really cheap versions of it, and then eventually it's just like, well, I don't know. I have to buy an original one, and then you spend $2,500 on an old Univibe. Ultimately, with that, like, you find nothing is going to ever sound like that. There's something very specific about that thing 
it's old, I don't know if it's the parts, how it aged, whatever it is, limited technology at the time. Getting an actual Univibe, I feel like showed me, hey, don't try to make it sound exactly like a Univibe because you're not going to. But most of the time, I don't want to know what somebody else has done just so it's not influenced like by a modern like counterpart. The original Univibe that I got when working on the depth and it sounds awesome. It's a really good sounding Univibe. Listen to it work. No problems. This is actually the second set of these things that I owned. I had bought them when I was in Party of Helicopters and actually took them on tour. But they have these foot switches that you access all this stuff with and they have big like multi-pin connectors and you know housed in plastic and they're not really conducive to like plugging and unplugging them and taking them on tour. <laughs> and eventually they broke and when it broke I couldn't really do anything with it at all and it was all of my effects. But it's all their analog like pedal effects put into a rack and it has this insta patch so you can kind of adjust the order of them and the foot switch you know turns them on and off they sound super good really good sounding effects is just all their pedals Garmin tremolo control from Toledo Ohio this is the first guitar effect ever made the Garmin tremolo this one does work when i got it it didn't and it was really cheap and i soldered this uh, extension cord on from a christmas display and the little oil can inside couldn't get it open to fill it with fluid again so i drilled a little hole inside and then covered it with copper tape and then the windex that i put in it dried up but it basically just shakes a little canister of uh, conductive fluid around a wire and it grounds the signal out that's how it makes tremolo this just adjusts how the canister shakes it's pretty cool these are all like pedals i either built for myself or earthquaker prototypes well, there's just drawers full of them there's the first hoof reaper this says octo down fuzz I know it doesn't work. First sound shank. Small Grand Orbiter Proto. Hoof transmitter. I remember when you built that. Yeah. You know, that was our first attempt at a dual pedal. Yeah. yeah. The I didn't think it sounded good. No, it doesn't. I do wonder if it still works and if it does in fact actually sound bad. But if that reverses the order. I remember really struggling over that. Ghost Echo 2, which I think became Levitation. <laughs> and there's the Palisades Proto. Nightmare inside. All the first Earthquaker pedals, these ones, are the ones I put up on eBay when I first started and no one bought. Fantastic Beast, Amp Hammer, Blaster, and Rippler. And then Old Tusk, Spectre. Old Disaster Transport. This one sounds really good. I really like the way the mixing circuit is done. It makes it quiet. Just passive mixing and the modulation is pretty cool. Yeah. The double burning overdrive. This is also a very old pedal, I think, too. Obviously, kind of in there, but it's a DoD 250 with the mods. Pretty cool. 
what's left of my DOD collection. They're like some of my favorite pedals ever made. They're all super simple and like very durable and they sound great. I love this one, the 450. And this chorus is also super good. It's the meat box with fly stickers applied. Somebody took that time. Stick their fly stickers on the rotten meat. The Schaller fuzz pedal, awesome. Kind of fuzz facey. I've never really traced it to see how close to it is, but it's like a it's louder. It's got a lot more output. It sounds really, really good. And the enclosure is cool. Maestro pedals, probably my favorite of all the uh, old effects brands. So everything about them, I think it looks cool. All their graphics, the shape of the enclosure. And this would probably be one of my favorite pedals ever made. And this one used to work perfectly. And I let it sit for a long time and now it doesn't. <laughs> Same thing with this Chenet mute box. Looks like a Maestro pedal. I believe it's a Mutron clone. Sounds really, really good. So this is most of the synth stuff that I have and I don't play synth at all. Some of it fell into my lap. Some of it I just liked the sound of it when I heard other people playing with it and you know decided I had to have it. Juno would be that. I did briefly play synth in a band called New Terror Class but I played synth with one hand while I was playing drums and I used a Juno 6 all analog no presets and if you screwed one thing up with a slider it would change the sound and when playing drums it was very hard to do but i like the sound of that pedal or of that synth i replaced the roland juno 6 with a casio keyboard from target that had a really nice symphony sound on it and i sold the juno to the sound guy at a show at the union in athens ohio because uh, i just got frustrated with it not working the same way every time uh, and then like a year or two ago, an old friend of mine put this up for sale on Instagram for $400. I couldn't say no. This Rhodes piano I bought at the Goodwill. Works perfectly. This awesome Piano Plus 30 that I bought from Ben V. Horn that has a really cool arpeggiator function on it. And really, if you run it through a guitar amp, it sounds just like a guitar, which I don't know if that's what you want from a synth, but it has a pretty cool sound to it. I don't know what it is that makes me want a guitar, but I know when I see it. Like there's something, like first I'm drawn to the way it looks, obviously. Like if it looks cool and what I think looks cool is like a f***ed up guitar. I was way into old Japanese guitars, like Kawai's and Tysco's. And it's like you see them and you're like, oh, that's super cool. And it's 50 bucks and then you get it and it's garbage and you end up spending like a fortune making it playable. Um, you know, I have a lot of stuff like that. I'm usually looking for something that is like, sounds decent, totally playable, and is like $200 or less. That's usually like my criteria for a guitar, but occasionally, I'll run across something where it's like, I can't say no, like the mint condition 1975 Jazzmaster is still in the case with like all of its paperwork and it has like a sealed bag with a cable and uh, the strap and stuff they used to give you that uh, somebody found and brought to the shop and was like, I thought you would like this. I used it at on two Earthquaker demo videos and I think when we were doing the data corruptor, I was using it and I stood up and I stepped on the cord and snapped the pick guard off. And that is exactly why I don't think I could have real vintage guitars because I cannot take care of them no matter how hard I try. <laughs> These Kawhi guitars, I own two of them. Yeah, this is the one I used to use in Relaxer. It's almost in tune. I put this Bigsby on it and it kind of ruined the way that it plays. So I wanted to put it, the old bridge back on it. Yeah, I got it and it was super screwed up and then Dan Johnson took it, put a lot of work into it and it played awesome. Like super nice vintage kind of like Fender type feel. These pickups are super cool. 
I don't know anything about them, but they sound really, really good. I like those guitars. You know, it's very important. I've been as copy of a Gibson double neck. It would not stay in tune, and I spent so what would feel like a small eternity trying to rapidly tune a 12 string guitar in total darkness and it eventually just got fed up with it so now it's just a cool thing i get to talk about on a video bc rich 90 dollars japan gaki fair best headstock ever put on a guitar ever reverse bc rich headstock this is a gunslinger with two pickups Plays amazing, sounds good. It's fluorescent pink. Well, this is the Rickenbacker when I was talking about like vintage guitars that I actually owned or collected. So 74, 360. I always wanted one of these things because Guy from Fugazi played one and his guitar always sounded super good. And he played through like that park in a 412 with all kinds of distortion, nothing, no problems with him. Any times I've ever tried to do it, it just feeds back horribly and sounds really thin and so apparently I'm missing, missing the secret. This was made by my friend Jimmy Carbonetti, entirely handmade with all hand tools. He wound the pickups in them with a sewing machine. They sound great. It's a really good sounding guitar. I really like these little copper side dots on them. And it has... It is in tune. Hey, this has a super weird, like unique neck shape. It's like fat and wide, but very, very comfortable. And obviously everything about it is from the mind of Jimmy. One of the most amazing dudes on earth. A total sweetheart. Guild S70. If anything, it just looks amazing. Like it was caught in a fire. My uncle Doug had one of these, but it was, uh, it was white and had like a real thin, fast neck, 24 frets. I used to play it all the time when I went to his house, and then I'd always been looking for one, and I came across this at Rock and Roll Vintage in Chicago, but I bought it online and didn't realize that the neck is much bigger than the one that he had. But it looks amazing, like a little battle X. St. Vincent guitar, currently my favorite guitar. Shockingly more metal than I would have thought. The pickup's super hot, but don't feedback. Really great neck. Love the neck profile. Love the body shape. Ridiculous color, got into gold hardware this year. Don't know why. Hate the headstock. Terrible headstock. I have this guitar made by Dave at Scale Model Guitars in Nashville, Tennessee. He also hand makes guitars, custom ordered. He doesn't really have a company, but they go by the name Scale Model when you call them and order a guitar. It's an RD body with a reversed Trini Lopez headstock set up like a jazz master and I believe Les Paul scale. Bright white, very pointy, very flashy. I'm waiting until I have the personality type to actually pull this off and I don't think it's ever gonna happen, but I love it. And Dave is a genius when it comes to working on guitars. He used to work at uh, Carter Vintage in Nashville. He dealt with a ton of high-end guitars. He's seen everything that's ever come through and he knows how to set stuff up. He hand carved the neck and it's like a perfect 59 Les Paul neck. It's an awesome guitar. I played a Nash guitar at a clinic at Guitar Riot in Cleveland like four or five years ago. It was something I would never want. It was a Telecaster, it was salmon pink, it was relict, and it was from a modern company. Like I wouldn't walk into a store and be like, that's what I want. But they were like, here, use this guitar. And I ended up like falling in love with a guitar. I ended up buying it. It's the main guitar I use for developing pedals forever. So this is the Nash guitar that I used a lot at Earthquaker when making pedals. Just standard Telecaster setup, but something about it. It just sounds really good, plays really good. Not in tune. Yeah, it was a great guitar. It changed my mind on, uh, you know, just relic new relic versions of old guitars. I think that Nash really knows what they're doing when it comes to making, you know, kind of vintage Fender style guitars. I have a couple of them. 
the Telecaster Deluxe is probably the most recent one I got. It's perfect, the perfect guitar. Let's see how perfect. It's perfect. This totally insane Nash Strat. It has a baseball bat for a neck. Very, very clearly a belt sander guitar. Totally not realistically relict at all. I feel like this has to be a factory second. I tried to buy it off of a guy at a little music store in Tennessee. And when I got to the point where I gave him my email address, he got super excited about Earthquaker and I ended up trading him six hooks. It sounds so good. <laughs> sounds awesome. This is a vintage vibe Squire Stratocaster that I gutted entirely. And the only thing that's original is the neck and the body. Uh, painted it this horrific powder blue color. I replaced all the electronics. I think they're some kind of noiseless samarium cobalt or something like that pickups in it. After I got done with it, I was like, well, that's horrible looking and I will probably never play it. But it does actually play amazing and it sounds really good and it just kind of got put off to the side. And then Mike Tolan started using it at Earthquaker as his tester guitar, and then he broke it in. I feel like Mike Tolan had a magic touch and turned this into a really nice guitar just by playing it and not really taking care of it. Now it's a super nice guitar. This is the Epiphone Scroll 550 that I used in Party of Helicopters for nine years. It was pretty much on every tour. I took off the coil tap because I never really used that. So it just works, you know, like a regular human guitar. Action was always really low, super easy to play. And like, I did like, always did like a lot of pull-offs and stuff. It seemed to lend itself to that. Um, you could get all the way up to the top. Also, it sounded really good. Like it's, you know, it's a lot like a Les Paul, but a little bit thinner. All of these wear marks and all of the cracks that happened to it was all from me playing it. So it's like the only guitar that I ever really played long enough to really break in. So it was the only guitar I think I would never get rid of. I mean, I think the whole time I was in Party of Helicopters, I tried to get another one of those and I never saw one in a store. I was always trying to get one on eBay, totally battling a guy, Dr. Bond. He just drove up the price of every one of those guitars. I never got one. <laughs> Two years ago, I finally got a backup for that guitar. And this one is actually way nicer than the original one. Plays better, sounds better. It's in better condition, but it doesn't feel like my guitar. But it's nicer. The thing that I have the most of are Jazz Masters. Only three or four of them are actual Fender Jazz Masters. The rest of them I made. And I mean, really, even how I landed on the Jazzmaster is that the guitar that I really like to play, the scroll, was like this big, like end-to-end. -end. The Jazzmaster like took the scale end-to-end -end of that guitar and kind of had a little bit of a Strat vibe to it. But still, like if you put humbuckers in it, which is what I do, you can kind of get a good mix of like a Fender and Gibson sound without it being like overbearing, like twangy or too hot heavy metal and i love the tremolo that's the best tremolo of any guitar and i use tremolo all the time this is probably my favorite jazz master the first one that i got that i actually stuck with the 68. i think right now i have it set up exactly how it was when i got it except for the mastery bridge but this guitar is awesome and also probably probably the only other guitar that I won't sell and would be super upset if it went away. But this is the guitar that I keep trying to model or like, you know, build a clone of and not succeeding. It's a built guitar modeled after a Fender 12. They made it uh, especially for me and Earthquaker. It's got our logo on the back of it. They did a series of guitars for NAMM. I think they did JHS and Old Blood Noise. There's a couple others that I don't remember off the top of my head. And they had one for Earthquaker. I really wanted a 12 string. 
It has a dispatch master built into it down here and a speaker cranker built into it up here. So you can turn the effects on and off with these little switches right here. And then it has, you know, the adjustments for all the controls. And it's a super awesome guitar. <laughs> So yeah, I pretty much resisted the urge to put weird stuff in here. My initial thought was it would be cool if it was like a rainbow machine and an organizer with the 12 string and then decided to keep it simple. So it would be more useful, I felt like, in the future. And I believe the idea that they had for these is there would be two of everyone's guitar, the one that they got to keep and then one that got sold. But I don't think they were ever sold to anybody. So might be the only one, might not. So but Bill makes super awesome guitars and they are great dudes. The value that people put on musical instruments, especially guitars, is very arbitrary. <laughs> like no piece of wood is worth $150,000 or whatever, but it's just like over time that stuff, it, it's just what people decide that it's worth. And like, I've, I've got cutoffs for sure, but largely I would say in the last year or two, like whatever the urge was to get stuff, the reverse is starting to happen where I just, I feel this anxiety about having all this stuff and it's not getting used and it's falling apart. And like, you know, partly because it's like I got a lot of money tied up in it and I could be using that for better things like, uh, you know, paying for our kids college. And then partly because I think that somebody should use all this old stuff. Like, it shouldn't sit around and collect dust in a basement in Akron, Ohio. But the real hoarder mentality is that even though I know I have all this stuff that other people can use, the next thought in my head is, but it's mine. <laughs>